great choir. Thank you guys and ladies. Jen knows that is one of my favorites, and uh, I didn't know till early this week or late last week we were going to do it, but it uh, brings joy to my heart. I have seen the light. Amen. Hey, I hear some amens. The question this morning, have you truly seen the light, amen. Amen. the light of Christ? That's why we're here this morning. Oh, for sure you may know the story of Jesus. You may have Luke 2 memorized word for word from the King James. But the question this morning is not do you know the story of Jesus, but do you know Jesus himself? I don't know how many of you, I, I, am, I am so thankful to be here this morning. Uh, Dave and, and Richard, I, I have a special instruction for you all. If David or Barry or Mike begins to doze off this morning, you have my permission to kick them or hit them in the neck or whatever. I hope they don't, but they're not used to such a, a comfortable ladies. I would be a little more graceful and gracious with you all. So, uh, lest you, you be careful with the ladies. Uh, if any of you ever read Jan Karen's Mitford series, any of you familiar with that? Oh, I see some hands going up. It's Wonderful, wonderful reading. The Father Tim Cavanaugh in Jan's beautiful series, Father Tim Cavanaugh is the pastor uh, in Mitford. Mitford is an idyllic little town. Some of you here this morning, smaller than Campbellsville, some of you here this morning can relate to what a small town like Mitford might be. Now, Father Tim is the priest, the pastor. He pastors the whole town. That's what you do in a town like that. Everybody knows Father Tim. And during this season in which you and I celebrate Christmas, one of, one of the, the facets that comes into our heart is that many of us have beautiful memories of Christmas's past. Now, the truth of the matter is, there would be some of us here this morning for whom Christmas memories are rather painful. Perhaps you're here this morning and you have lost a spouse or a dear loved one or a dear friend and this is the first Christmas with which, in which you have been without the, the one that meant so much to you. And this may be a painful Christmas, but for many of us, Christmas memories are wonderful. I have shared with you uh, what Murray, Kentucky was like to me. Well, Father Tim, long before he was ever pastor, and you all have heard me say I was a human long before God called me to pastor, but Father Tim, had, as a child, had beautiful memories, and, and one of his family's traditions was to begin to set up the nativity scene a month or so uh, before Christmas Day on the first day of Advent. And as Father Tim tells it now, as he looks back to his childhood days, his father told him what to do is he carefully placed Mary and Joseph and the empty major on top of a low bookcase that was there in their living room. And after he had carefully, oh so carefully, placed the cradle and Mary and Joseph, he would take two donkeys and a woefully sad looking horse, a cow, a calf, and two sheep he would place on the other side, and they would stand straight in a concert of expectation that indeed Christmas was coming. And his father and mother would sit and watch him as he carefully put together the nativity, hand-carved, hand-painted figures into a scene that he tried to make fresh every year. That's one of the challenges of Christmas. One of the challenges for a pastor or a preacher at Christmas time, how do we make fresh a message that many of us have heard virtually all our lives? So Father Tim, long before he would ever be a pastor, would take great care. It was his way of putting his mark on Christmas, and he would set it up a little differently each year. As he arranged on one side, there would be four shepherds in the meantime waiting in the dining room for their opportunity to be placed on the sideburn, sideboard as the journey toward Christmas and the manger on Christmas morning. 
And during those days, as a young boy, Tim could barely wait for the coming of Christmas Day when he would finally carefully take the babe and place that baby in the manger. And in the meantime, the baby rested in a drawer at the top of the sideboard in a silver ladle. That's where the baby laid prior to Christmas morning. And Tim tells it when Christmas morning finally came after a month of Advent, the tree would be up and as he would see it, the tree had the shining bulbs and lights and ornaments and tinsel. And there were always presents waiting to be opened. But there was always still the baby Jesus hidden in the top drawer. And finally he would take that baby out and carefully place that baby in the manger. And then he would see what he was desperately longing to see. He would see that beautiful twinkle in his mother's eyes. The light that had shone like the star on top of their tree. Their cedar tree in those days. And he would gladly wish his family Merry Christmas. And they would say those same words back. And he brought the shepherds and the baby to the manger, moved the cow and the donkey to try to give them a better view of what was happening. And finally, once that baby was there in that nativity scene, there in that little cradle, after a long month of waiting, the scene was complete. Years later, if you know the Mitford series well, you'll know that God eventually brought Father Tim, a beautiful and loving wife by the name of Cynthia, and one day there in the town bookstore, Father Tim comes across an ancient, an old, old nativity scene. Oh, it's not pretty. There's nothing pretty about it. He says it was a motley assortment of sheep, an angel with a mere stub for a wing, an orange camel lying in a, a manger of bubble wrap was a forlorn babe. Twenty odd pieces, he said, from probably three different nativity scenes. And Father Tim set out to, to put all those pieces back together to restore an angel's broken wing. There was, a, there was a horse there, maybe a donkey in the nativity scene. It was all black, including its eyes. And Tim said, the first time I saw it, I thought it was a lump of coal. So he decides to bring new life to that nativity scene in preparation to give it as a gift to his beloved Cynthia. Brothers and sisters, it's almost time as we gather here this morning, it's almost time to put the baby in the manger, is it not? We've been dealing over the last few weeks with what I have deemed the questions of Christmas. The who, what, where, when, why, and how. This morning, this morning we are dealing with the why. We've not dealt with the why yet. If we have conversations over the course of the Christmas season, if, if we have conversations even with someone who does not know Jesus Christ, who has not yet seen clearly, blindingly, the light of Jesus Christ, they may know the story of the birth, as I mentioned earlier, but have they seen the light? And when we engage them in conversation, remember, brothers and sisters, it is not only important to tell them the story of Jesus, but as we deal this morning, we deal with the why question. Just as important is the story as the story is why Jesus came to this earth. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Here we are the day before Christmas Eve. We're dealing with the why. Matthew's account is different. It's much briefer than the account that we know so well in Luke.
Matthew 1. Let me ask us if we're able to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. And as I say every week, God understands if, if you cannot. Let's read from Matthew's Gospel. As we begin our consideration this morning of the why, we're dealing with the backstory of Christmas. Behind the scenes, the reasons this morning why Christ came. Matthew tells us clearly, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. And you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took Mary home as his wife. But, she had, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Let's pray. Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, as we worship and praise you today, as we contemplate the miraculous birth of your son, our Savior Jesus Christ, God, we pray that you would draw us ever closer to you through the power of your Holy Spirit and your living word. In the name of the one whose birth we proclaim, Jesus Christ, we come in prayer. Amen. You're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus. The very name Jesus, the Greek form of the Hebrew Yeshua or Joshua. Literally, Jehovah is salvation. The message that the angel conveyed to Joseph was that the one who had been conceived in Mary by the Holy Spirit was a divine Messiah. The one who had been promised throughout the history of Israel and that this divine person would save his people from their sins. The questions of Christmas this morning, the why question. The word why, the little word why. In its adverbial form, the definition of the word why is for what reason or purpose. That's not complicated. For what reason or purpose applied to this text on this day before Christmas Eve, two days before Christmas, the question of why can appropriately be translated for what reason or purpose Did Jesus Christ come to earth? Most of us are familiar with the narratives if we, as we have said, so we're we're going backstage to the back story. I want to give you this morning, I want to give you 11 reasons why Christ came. I want to tell you up front, there are more than 11 reasons, Jen, why Christ came. However, We only have 19 more minutes, and I'm watching the clock. So we are limited to 11, not 9, not 10. What? Yeah, you set a timer. Jen keeps me me straight. Let me give you, if you have your Bibles, turn with me as we read these texts. We begin in John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Now, these these are not complicated reasons for the most part. And you may know many of them. You may not know all of them. You certainly have not considered them in this context as to what reason or purpose perhaps Christ came. But in John chapter 6, the 38th verse, Jesus declares this. 
For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of the one who sent me. The first reason I would present to you this morning, and these are not in any particular order of importance, they aren't ranked, but the first reason that Jesus Christ came in our text this morning in John chapter 6 is that the Son of Jesus came to this earth to do his Father's will. This, this was not by accident. Jesus came to do God's will. The text is clear. <coughs> it's not rocket science at this point. So reason number one, Jesus came to do God's will. The second reason, turn over just a few pages to John chapter 12. The song that the choir and the accompanists and the trio brought this morning fits so beautifully with this passage of Scripture. John 12, verse 46. The words of Jesus, brothers and sisters, he says this, I have come into the world as a light. So that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. I have seen the light. And the question that I ask of this congregation this morning that have gathered here. Corporately, we have seen the light. But what really matters this morning is your personal, individual perspective. Have you seen the light? The second reason Jesus came to this earth is to bring light where there was darkness darkness. And prior to the birth of Jesus Christ, darkness pervaded this world. I've come into this world as a light so that whoever believeth in me, so that no one, no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. God does not want you, he does not want me to live in darkness. That's why Jesus came. Third reason. John 18, turn over another three or four pages. The Gospels all have different perspectives of the birth of Jesus. One of John's, one of John's aims is to give us the, the doctrine, the theology behind the backstory of Jesus, of his coming, of his living, and of his dying. John chapter 18, verse 37. The second half of the verse. He says, For I came into this world to testify to the truth. The one, the baby whose birth we celebrate. The baby who, whom we cannot wait to get there in the manger. The, ba the baby came to bear witness to truth. Pilate said to him, you're a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king indeed. In fact, the reason I came into this world was to testify to the truth. The truth of what you just said. Turn to the left, still in John. John chapter 6. Verse 51, John 6, 51. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus came, he lived and he died. He was born to offer to you and to me eternal life. As the popular saying goes, wrap your mind around that truth. His relatively short life of 
30 or so years and his death upon the cross allows you and allows me as followers of Jesus Christ to live with the realization that whatever happens to us while we are here on this planet, the hope that we have of eternal life in the presence of God, the Father. That's why we ask, have you personally seen the light? There is eternity at stake here. This is a matter of eternal life and death this morning. Jesus came to offer to you and to me eternal life. Turn back to the left, go to Luke's gospel. Luke 4. Jesus came. Why did he come? He came to preach the gospel. He says in verse 18, Quoting the prophet, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's supper, (laughs) to the Lord of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to preach the gospel that the world may know what he was about, that the world may know know who he was. And while it wasn't popular in those days, look what Mark tells us in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. In the 45th verse. Well, but let's back up, let's back up to 43. And these are the words of Jesus. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Wow, that was a statement that would fly in the face of the conventional worldly wisdom of those days. Whoever wants to be great must be your servant. He goes on. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man, speaking of himself, even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus was born to serve. And secondarily, but not of any less importance. Jesus was born to give his life. He was born to die, if you will, to give his life as a ransom for you and for me. He died on our behalf because of the sins that pervade your life and mine. Jesus was born to serve. We quoted the words of Isaiah Moments ago, even in Isaiah chapter 61, the prophet gives us another reason Jesus came. Jesus came to bind broken hearts. As we mentioned earlier, some would be here this morning with heartache, perhaps bringing grief into this place, That even in a place where we sing so joyfully and beautifully, go tell it on the mountain. It's kind of foot stomping music, if you will, that arrangement. But while we stomp our feet and clap our hands, there are some of us here this morning that just don't quite feel like it. One of the reasons Jesus came is to bind your precious broken heart. To bring healing to your heart we get down to the gospel John 3 16 you know it you don't have to turn but turn if you want to
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son in the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. Why did Jesus came come? To show, to show God's love for sinners. That's you and that's me. He also came to call you and me to repentance. Prayer meeting Wednesday night, we talked a lot about repentance. We're praying that there will be a, an overwhelming sense of individual and thus corporate repentance in this church that God might bring revival and renewal to this church as we move into spring into the freshness of spring whether we have a pastor yet or not but for the last 21 days there's been a group of you all that have been going through a, a study called awakened by claude king and we've all been praying that god would work in our hearts and lives individually to renew us to bring us back to the love that we had in the first place for our savior jesus christ and one of the things that demands of me and of you for that to happen is a sense of godly sorrow over our sin and a desire to repent, to turn from that sin in our lives. Jesus said in Mark chapter 2, he said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor. I've not come to call the righteous, but I have come to call sinners. Matthew chapter 1 that we read when we began. You're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. 17th verse in John 3, we don't know as well as we did do the 16th. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but rather save the world through him. When John saw Jesus coming toward him, he pointed and looked and said, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. The reasons why Jesus came. Why did he become man? To die. As God, fully divine, Jesus could not die. As fully man, he could he was born human, born to die, to defeat Satan, to destroy sin, to end eternal separation that you and I experience without Jesus Christ. Max Licato writes this. He said, the God of the universe was born into the poverty of a peasant and spent his first night on this earth in a cow's feed trough. The God of the universe left the glory of heaven and moved into our neighborhood. Who could have imagined that he would do such a thing? Why did he do it? And he summarizes all that I have said this morning. Because he loves to be with the ones he loves. And that's you. And that's me. One of the great anthems that we sing at Christmas, a hymn if you will. Come thou long expected Jesus. You know the next line? Born to set thy people free. Come thou long expected Jesus. Born to set thy people free. From our fears and sins release us. Let us find our rest in thee. The whys Jesus came. The question that I would ask this morning. Where do you find your rest? It's not a throwaway question. It's not a rhetorical question. Where do you find your rest? It is in Jesus, elsewhere, 
The good news of Jesus Christ is that God loves you and loves me. And his son was born to die on your behalf. So the invitation on this day before, the day before Christmas, is for you, regardless of how many times you've seen the story, to acknowledge at a beautifully personal level that there is a light shining in the darkness, bursting through the shadows, delivering the dawn, and that light is Jesus. And he longs to be forever with the ones he loves. And the miracle in that is that it includes every one of us. So you come this morning. In a moment, we're going to sing a, 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 a hymn of opportunity to respond if you're here this morning and I know it's right before Christmas but if if you're here and you're looking for a place to invest your life in ministry we would invite you to come and be a part of Campbellsville Baptist Church as well I'm going to pray you respond as God would lead you to do so join with me father we bow our heads before you come Lord Long expected Jesus, whose birth we celebrate. God, that we recognize this morning that you were born to set us free from all that encumbers us. Thank you, Lord. Stir the hearts of your people. In Christ's name, we come before you in prayer. Amen. Let's stand, church, as we sing together.